Sure. And as I started to think about it, I started to think about the process of how it took them about four years to construct the Golden Gate Bridge. But the thing that really interested me, and any time I go, I've went to Chicago and I've gone to San Francisco, and I, I like to look at the buildings, I like to look at the structures, the, the trains, how the trains run over the roads in, in Chicago. It's stuff like that just intrigues me, it interests me. And when I look at the Golden Gate Bridge, you can see there the guy wires is what they call them that go up and down to kind of sturdy the bridge there. And one thing that I've noticed when I was looking at those wires when I've been there is if you look closely at those wires, it's not just one single wire that makes up that big piece of wire there. There's many of wires that are wound together, spun together to form one big wire, and it actually has a purpose. And the purpose of that type of construction is it actually allows the Golden Gate Bridge to swing each way from over its, um, its, over its structure in the water, and it allows it actually to swing 27 feet, 8 inches either way of the structure. And I know some of you are kind of thinking, and I've crossed that in a car, what's wrong with me? <laughs> you know, that's it's scary to think about. That's a long ways for it to travel, but they've studied it to a science, and they've got it down where that type of construction will actually allow the bridge to sway that much, and it won't fall. It won't come crashing down. And it's, it has a purpose. There's a purpose behind that. And when I started to think about that type of construction, I started to think about us as a church body. How there's many of us in this church body, but each individual one of us makes up the unified body together. And when we're unified together, we can form a stronger body together. And while thinking about that, I wanted to think about how, how can we become united? What do we need to do to become united together? And there was two points that came to my mind. And the first point that came to my mind was we need to be unified so when life comes our way, we have, it, we have each other to help us through. When stuff goes wrong in our lives or we make mistakes, we have each other to help each other out. And second, I know Brother Chris even alluded to this a little bit, is we're already in revival, and I know that. But there's a greater revival. And for us to see that revival that God truly wants us to see, we have to get to the place where nothing can come between us. We have to get to a place where we say, you know what? I'm not going to be warring against other people in the church. And so I want to talk about these two points and go through this a little bit. And so in, if we become united, worth my first point, if we become united, when life comes our way, we'll be able to withstand it. We'll be able to get through it. And you're going to face some situations we're going to make our fair share of mistakes. Why is that? Because we're human. Sure. Not a single one of us is perfect. Not any of us on the platform, all the way to the back of the church. We're all going to make mistakes. We all have our shortcomings. We all will get to a point in life where we just make the wrong decision. That's life. That's what happens. We are human. But if we are united as brothers and sisters, when we make that mistake or when we take the wrong step, we can be there for each other. We can help each other out. And... When I started to think about that, I started to think about how that doesn't mean that you're there to condemn your brother for their mistake. You're not there to say, you know, this is the mistake you've made. You're not there to put a spotlight on it. But rather, it's there that when they're at their lowest point and they're saying, I need somebody to help me. I need somebody to encourage me. That you're there to help lift them up. You're there to help encourage them. You, you're there to let them know that they can still make it that God still has a purpose for their life, and that their mistake's not too big for God. There's nothing that's too big for God to ever forgive you of. And sometimes we need somebody else to let us know that because when we're in our situation, we're in our mistake, it seems greater than God. If we're being honest, be, why? Because we know the mistakes we've made, and we're the hardest critics on our own self, and we're saying, you know, this is the mistake I've made. Can God really forgive me of it? And he can, and he will. And... You may, you may even say, you know what, I don't need somebody to help me. I can do it on my own. And this is kind of what God was showing me about that. And you see in Ecclesiastes 4 through 9, the warning signs, or 4, 9 through 12, God gives you some warning signs saying, if you don't have someone there, when you fall, you are going to struggle when you get back up. If you're saying, you know what, I can do it on my own, you may be able to. But there is a warning sign that he gives you in those scriptures 
And the reason is because the devil's going to do everything he, try, he can to try to keep the church from uniting. The reason he's going to do that, he, he knows if we become united together, where there's nothing that's coming in between us, then we're going to be a strong force. But if we're not united, then we are going to be divided. That's the opposite side of that coin. If we're not united, we are going to be divided. And if we are divided, then when we make mistakes and we don't have someone to help us up, we're going to spend a lot of time down. We're going to spend a lot of time trying to get back up. And that's a dangerous thing. Because think about it. When someone's standing, if somebody comes to approach you or tries to attack you, what are you? you're kind of in a defensive position already. But if you're on the ground, you're struggling to get back up, you become defenseless. And that's when the devil starts to say, you know what, this is my chance to attack. This is my opportunity because they're no longer able to protect themselves. They're no longer able to fend me off and I can attack them. But if you have somebody there to help you up or to say, you know what, I'm here to fight with you. I'm here that, so the devil can attack you. And you're going to get knocked down by life. You're going to spend that time down. That's going to happen. That's, that's something that's going to take place in life. But we don't want to spend too much time down because it's not healthy for our walk with God. And when I started to think about it, if, if someone spends too long after having a knee surgery or something like that, if you spend too much time sitting down and saying, you know what, I'm not going to get up, I'm not going to try to walk again, you can become crippled and you can become to the point where you're not going to be able to walk. And you, if you apply that to your spiritual life and say, you know what, if I spend too much time trying to get back up, I can eventually become crippled, spiritually crippled. And the reason that will happen is because after getting knocked down so many times, we get weary of trying to get back up and get back up and get back up. And the danger is eventually it may seem hard to get back up on your own. You may start to get to that place where you say, you know what, I just I can't do it anymore. I'm struggling. I've, I've made too many mistakes. I can't, I can't get up anymore. I, don't, I can't advance in the kingdom of God. And you start to become spiritually crippled. That's what's happening. And if you look at Ecclesiastes 4.10, it says, For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. And then it, it has the, the colon there, and it gives kind of a warning. It says, But woe to him that is alone, for when he falleth, for he hath none other to help him up. He's saying no one's going to help you to get back up, and that's a dangerous place to be in. It's a scary place to be in. If you stay down when you fall, you won't, able to, you won't be able to make progress in God. And if you stay down long enough, your, your walk with God will eventually come to a stop. If you get to the point where you're just saying, you know what, I can't make it anymore, I'm struggling, your point of uh, pro advancing or progressing in the kingdom of God is going to come to an eventual stop. And that's not what God wants. God doesn't want your walk with him to stop progressing. God doesn't want to see anybody come to a place where they just say, you know what, I give up. I can't make it anymore. That's not God's will. And for us to not become spiritually crippled, we have to have tr trust in our brothers and our sisters. You have to be able to say, you know what, I need someone there to help me when I fall. I need someone to help pick me up. And I know when we think about that, that can be a, a scary thought or it can be a hard thought to get through. And why is that? Because... As humans, it's, it's hard for any of us to admit we make mistakes. We all know that. Nobody likes to say, you know what, I'm wrong. That's one of the hardest things to say is I'm wrong. But it's one of the most powerful. It's one of the most powerful things you could ever say. And even if you've known someone for many years or if it's a spouse, even sometimes it's even hard to tell your own spouse that you've made a mistake or something like that. But even if you feel comfortable enough with somebody it's still even hard to let them know, hey, you know, I've made a mistake. I need someone to help me. And why is that? Well, first of all, it's because no one likes to admit they're wrong. No one likes to say, you know what, I've made a mistake. I'm struggling. Because when we come to church, it looks like everyone's doing good. Everyone's happy. Everyone's advancing in the kingdom of God. But when it, if we really come down to it, we're struggling. There's situations in life that we're going through. Maybe it's, you know, you don't know how you're going to make your next bill payments or you're worried about your kids that you've been praying for. And there's things, there's life situations that are going to happen. And no one likes to feel weak 
No one likes to feel like they need someone else. And it's, it's, it's a sad thing. It's, 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 it's hard. I know when I had my knee surgery, it kind of got to me where I was saying, you know, it's hard because I don't want anybody to help me. I want to be able to do things on my own. That's, what, that's how we are. We want to be independent people. We want to say, you know what, I can do it. I don't need anyone's help. And second, the second point, too, for that is it's hard because the devil will lie to us. He says, if you go to your brother or your sister, they're going to broadcast it to everyone. If you let someone know the mistakes you've made, that's going to be all over the church and everyone's going to know about it. And you're going to see those people three times a week at least. You know, we come to Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, you know, and that's not including if we're hanging out together, spending time together. You're going to see at le- each other at least three times a week. And it's hard because you're wanting to admit things to people. You're wanting to have people that have confidence in you and you have confidence in them saying, you know what, I need someone to help me. But the devil's saying that if you let somebody know what's really going on, they're going to know. They're going to see what's actually going on. And that's not bad. That's not the wrong thing. God knows we're going to make mistakes. God already knows that we're going to fail. We're going to fall. We all know that. We all know that each other makes mistakes. I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect. So why don't we have the confidence to say, you know what? If my brother has a problem, I'm going to keep it in confidence. But I'm also going to have enough confidence to say, hey, you know what? This is what I'm going through. And if we, if we can get to that point, we can become united and we, we'd be able to feel a little bit more comfortable because now we're saying, you know what, they have something about me and I have something about them. And we're not going to go broadcasting it to everyone. And if someone admits to you that they've fallen or they've made a mistake, it's in confidence. And you don't need to go publicizing it to people. You don't need to be going and telling your family members. You don't even need to be going and telling your spouse. If it's somebody that's saying, you know what, I need this help. Can you pray with me? Can you help me? You don't need to be telling anyone else. It's somebody that has gone to you, and we need to keep that confidence. Amen? Amen. And when I started to think about it, and I know this may seem kind of harsh, but it's the reality. It's if you go and you start publicizing it and you go start talking about other people, at that point, you're in the wrong. You're the one that has a problem, and God's going to be dealing with that. And... We don't go to our brothers and sisters in confidence to admit our faults so it can become gossip. We don't need to be broadcasting it outside of these church walls. If something's going on, somebody calls you from another church. I know we have relatives outside of the church. If they call you and say, hey, you know, this is what I've heard, you you can just say, you know what, I'm not going to talk about it. It's for the church walls and the church walls only. You know, that's, that's where we have to get to that point because we have to become united as a church body. And... When, you, when I started to think about this, I started to look at the story of Job. And I know it's, it's a long story, so I'm not going to go through it all. But you, you can think about how Job was a wealthy man. And he starts to lose everything. Everything that he's ever had, he loses it all and he becomes very sick. And we see towards the end of that story there where Job's friends actually come to visit him. And the purpose of them to visit him is to comfort him. Um, in his time of loss. We know, we actually know the story. And when you look at that story, they have a very strange way of comforting him. If you're going to come comfort me in the way his friends did, I would play that you stay home and I can, I can help have someone else come and help me. But when they started to say that they were going to comfort him, they actually came and just stared at him. And none of us like to be stared at. It's an uncomfortable feeling. You can be sitting in a place, and if somebody's staring at you, you eventually feel it, and you start looking like somebody's staring at me. And so Job is just sitting there, and his friends are just staring at him. And they start to begin to wonder and think about, why is Job going through this? They're trying to figure out what's going on in his life, what's the mistakes that he's made. And instead of his friends helping him back up, they, des- they decided to start to criticize and judge Job. And you start to, th- and they start to think about, you know, maybe he's made some mistakes. Maybe he's sinned, you know. That's, they're looking from the outside perspective. And sometimes we see that, you know, you say, oh, my brother's struggling. You know, well, you don't know what he's going through. And if you don't know what he's going through, don't talk about it. That's not your position. That's not your place. And you can continue to read in and, and Job, and you see that God actually ends up talking to Job's friends. 
And he lets them know, if you do not have Job pray for you, then me, myself, I'm not going to forgive you. And that's a scary thing to think about. If you're not willing to go and ask Job for forgiveness, then I'm not going to give you forgiveness. God lets Job's friends know that if you're not willing to ask, I'm not willing to give. Why? Because God knows that they're in the wrong. And when you think about that, if you go around talking about somebody, even if they have made some mistakes, you're going to still need to go ask them for forgiveness. Because at that point, you're also in the wrong. You're also in the, the, the point where God's saying, you know what, if you're not willing to ask for forgiveness, I'm not going to give forgiveness. And that's a hard thing to do. I know sometimes, you know, we make the mistakes and we've talked about people. Why? Because we're human. Like I said, none of us are perfect. But it's hard to go to people and say, you know what, I need forgiveness. You know, I said some things I shouldn't have said. You don't have to go into full detail, but just say, you know what, brother, sister, I need your forgiveness. I need you to help me. And God's showing us that it's not our job to judge our brothers and our sisters in the church. That's not what we're here for. That's not our place. But rather, it's our job to help them get back to their feet if they fall. It's our job to say, you know what, I see you're struggling. I see you've made a mistake. I see you're hurting. I see you need somebody to help you. I'm here to pray with you. Is there something that I can help you pray for? Is there something that you need to break through for? Is there, you know, are you been praying for your kids? Can I help you pray for your kids? And we need to stop looking for other people's faults and stop putting a spotlight on them. And, amen. And when I started, when I thought about that, I looked and was thinking about Matthew 6, 14 through 15. And it kind of warns about this here. And it says, for if you forgive men of... Uh, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So that's just something to think about. If you're not willing to forgive your brother, if somebody's offended you, you have to be willing to forgive them. It's not your place to hold on to it. Because if you're not willing to forgive, God's not going to be willing to forgive you either. And then my second point is... Unity is going to bring a great revival. I know we're in revival already. We're seeing it not just in our, in our church, but around, this, around the churches around us. And in our section, we've gone to youth events, and they've been talking about unity in the youth department. We have meetings at least once a month, you know, a Zoom call where we're getting together, and there's unity in the, in the youth department, and there's unity in the pastors and preachers. We're starting some classes for new ministers, and things are starting to work together, and it's time we start not to just unite as our church, but to unite with other churches. Amen? Amen. It's, we're, yes, we're the church body of Dinuba, but in, in bigger picture, we're the church of Christ. We're the body of Christ. And we're all looking to see this, the, you know, the reward. We're all looking for that great reward. And for us to see that revival that our church has pro been promised, it's going to take our church to become unified. And this is kind of a point that I started to think about, and honestly, it kind of made me uncomfortable. And I know pastor's not here, but it made me uncomfortable to think about, and I know it's going to get a little bit real, and it's going to hit some of us, you know, in the heart, and it's going to hurt, but God gave it to me for a reason. And when, we, when people see the church from the outside, people that are wanting and thinking about coming to the church, if they see a united church, if they see a unified body, it's actually going to draw them in. They're going to say, you know what, I want to be a part of that. They're going to hunger for that. And people outside can see when there's no unity in a church. We can see it, but sometimes we put blinders on saying, you know what, no, it's all, it's all good. Everything's, everything's flowing. Everything's nice. There's no problems in our church. But if we're honest with ourselves, you know, there's some things we need to take care of. There's some things that... We need to say, you know what, I'm not going to let that be a hindrance. Because if we allow it to come between us, it's going to keep others from coming into the church. And it's actually going to be a hindrance to those wanting to come in. Amen. And God wants to bring that great revival to our city. But we have to become unified. And not only do we have to have unity in our church, but like I said, it has to be outside of our church walls. When we see a brother or sister in Visalia while we're at the mall, you can't just walk by and look at them and kind of give them that eye like, you know, yes, you're in church, but I'm not going to talk to you. Be friendly. Walk up to someone and say, you know, God bless you. It's good to see you. We've all felt it. 
I know if, if I was to ask for a show of hands, almost everybody's hand would be raised where we've gone into a, a supermarket or we've gone to the mall, we've gone to somewhere, and you walk by somebody and you've seen them at a church event or you've seen them at somewhere, and you guys just walk right by each other. There's no unity, and we need that unity outside of our church walls. But not just outside the church walls, we need unity in our own church. But not also just in our own church, but in our homes. We need unity inside of our homes. And husbands and wives, you need to be unified together. You need to get behind each other, support each, support each other. And not just that, but young people, you know, children, you need to get behind your parents. If they tell you not to do something, it's for a purpose. They know what's happening. They know where it's going to lead to. You need to stand with them. And I know it's hard, you know, for young people. Why? Because, oh, I'm not going to listen to what they have to say. I can make my own decisions. I was in that place. But that's not the attitude we need to have. We need to have the attitude to say, you know what, I'm going to agree with them. I'm going to get behind them. I'm going to get with them and stand and support their decisions. And also as a family, as a family unit, we have to get behind our pastor. That's something that we have to do. And it can't just say, you know what, we're behind him on some things. We have to be behind him on all things. And in our ministers' trainings that we've been having, that's something they talk about. They even admit it and say, you know, you're not always going to see eye to eye with your pastor. You're going to have disagreements. There's going to be things that you question. But you can't let that come between you. You know, if, if there's something that you don't see eye to eye with on pastor, support pastor. You know, if you have a question, come to him. Pastor's the kind of person that his doors are open. He's willing to say, you know what, this is, this is what I see and this is why you need to do it. He'll explain it to you. Amen. And if you start to talk bad about the pastor or the man of God in your own home, your children are going to notice that. And that's not just going to bring you division in your own home. It's going to bring division to the church. It's, it shouldn't be a conversation around the dinner table or when you're out. It shouldn't be something that, oh, you know, I don't agree with pastor on this. Or I don't agree with the pastor on this. And it's not just on the pastor level. And I started to think about this. And I know, like I said, this is where I'm getting kind of uncomfortable. But I know me, myself, I don't think I'm the best person that could ever lead a service. And I'm sure... The musicians, the praise singers, everybody, we don't feel like we're the best, you know, musicians, the best praise singers. You know, so we aren't going to be the best. And if you hold us and think we are going to be the best, we're sorry. We're going we're gonna to let you down. But you're also not going to, you can't get to the point where you say, you know what, they're not doing a good job. You know, yes, we're not going to be the best, but I'll tell you something. When we come to church, there's a presence of God. That just flows freely in our, in our church. The praising gets anointed. The musicians are anointed. There's an anointed pre-service that comes in and just flows. And it sets an atmosphere of praise and worship. And we can't take that for granted. We have to be thankful for what we have. It may not be the best, but it is anointed. And it is what God has given to our church. And God has placed each one of us in a position. If you're here, if you're a soul winner, a Sunday school teacher, you know, the pastor, everyone's been placed here for a, pur a purpose. We may not be the best person to fill the position, but we're the person that God has placed. And when I thought about that, God's placed each one of us. It's like a puzzle. A puzzle will only fit one way. And the church body is only going to fit one way. We've been placed in the positions because that's how God sees, you know, that's where the church is going to reach its fullest potential. That's where they're going to see the revival that I'm wanting for them. You know, I know pastor doesn't take decisions that he makes for who he's going to appoint to positions lightly. It's something that he entrusts in each and every one of us and anyone else, Sunday school teachers. He trusts you. You know that you're going to go back there. You're going to spend time in prayer and say, you know what, I want to affect a child. I want to minister to them. I want to give them a life-changing experience that's going to say, you know what, there is a God that loves me. There is somebody that cares about me. You don't know what they're going through at home. You don't know what's happening in their life. Amen. And there's not a single one of us that deserves our position. There's not a single one of us that says, if you, and if you feel that way, you need to check your spirit. 
because not a single one of us deserves the position. And I don't deserve a position over somebody else. The only difference is, is, you know, we get to the place where you have to be willing to say, God, I'm willing to be used by you. And if you have that attitude saying, you know what, I think I can do a better job than them. Or I think I can do, you know, a better job in the men's department or in the ladies' department or a Sunday school teacher. Then that's why God's not using you. Because instead of encouraging somebody and saying, you know what, I'm going to ask them, do you need anything for your Sunday school class? You know, can I do anything around the church to help the men's department? If we have a fundraiser, if you're not one of the first ones there to say, you know, what do we need help doing? What do we need to do? How do we need to help raise funds? That's why God's saying, you know what, you're not ready for the position. God's not going to give you a position that you have not made yourself ready for. If, if that position's going to get to you and you're going to think you're better than someone else or something like that, God's saying, you know what, I'm going to hold this position for you. It's not saying you're not qualified or God doesn't think you're in a, a good spot to do that position because you may be able to do the position better than someone else. But God's saying, you know what, you need, you need to take an evaluation of your own heart, of your own spirit and say, you know what, even if I'm not in the position, I'm going to support them. I'm going to get behind them 110%. Amen. And the way I thought about that too is, Every single one of us is replaceable in the kingdom. Every single one of us is a piece that's interchangeable. And God can use any one of us to fulfill his purpose. The question is, is are you going to be willing to fulfill that purpose? Are you going to have the right attitude? Amen. And God's only willing to use people that are going to say, it's not for my glory, God. But it's for your glory. It's for your honor. Because that's where you have to get. You have to say, you know what, God? I must decrease so you can increase. That's where we have to get, church. We have to not be able to say, you know what? I think so-and-so is doing a bad job. Or I think this is going on. Or You have to be willing to say, you know what? I'm going to get behind them. I'm going to say, you know what? You're going to be able to make it. Because I can tell you right now, there's a lot of us in our positions that, first of all, we don't feel like we deserve it. But second of all, we don't feel capable. And I know God has given us the capabilities to do it, but we don't feel like we do it to the best of our abilities. We say, you know, it's something we struggle with. We say, God, I need your help. God, what more can I do? I feel like, I, I feel like I'm lacking. I feel like there's more that I can do. There's more. And that's, that's how we get. That's something that we go through. And there was one brother that he talked about how our success is not measured on whether it's a church growth or, you know, how many kids we can bring to Sunday school, how big our youth group's going to get, how big our church is going to get. That's not how we need to look at growth. We need to look at growth and say, am I in the will of God? Am I listening to the voice of God? If I'm a Sunday school teacher, am I ministering to these kids and saying, you know what, there is a hope. There is a God that loves you. It's something that you have to think about, and you have to encourage each other. I know we're not all Sunday school teachers. We're not all ministers. We're not preachers. We're not all soul winners. You know, some of us are shyer than others. But it's time that we start saying, you know what? If my brother and my sister's in the, this position, if I'm not in that position, that's okay. I'm going to get behind them and say, brother, is there anything that I can do for you? You know, can I help you with this event? Can I help you with this fundraiser can I help you do something you know and one of the biggest things is clean up if we have a fundraiser be there to help people clean up after everybody's helped serve or after everybody's helped do things that's one of the hardest things to do why because you're wore out you know and if you're there to say you know what brother I'm here to help you clean up sister I'm here to help you clean the kitchen after a fundraiser after we've served it goes beyond anything that you could ever say Anything that you could ever, you know, say you're doing a good job. If you actually help them and say, you know, I, I'm with you. I'm helping you. It's going to speak leaps and bounds beyond that. And I'm coming kind of to a close here already, but God wants to use every single person in this place. Every single person in this place this morning, he wants, us to, he wants you to be used to bring a revival to the city of Dinuba. 
I know some of us live outside of the uh, city of Dinuba, but not only in our city, but you can affect your street block. You can affect the people around you. Amen. And you can affect the people at your job. I know not all of us work in the city of Dinuba, but what is it? It's not a bad thing to say, you know, I know Sister Andrea, she works in Hanford. If she wins somebody there, you know, and somebody goes to Brother Cantrell's church, hey, still part of the church body. Brother Chris said it this morning. He has a friend going to the church there in Fresno, still part of the church body. We may not see the number increase here, but God sees the increase in his kingdom. Amen. He needs each and every single one of us to reach a lost and dying world. We've heard it. It's been a, an ongoing theme throughout our services. There's a city outside these four walls that is hungry for God. Everything going on, the situations in life, it's becoming a struggle. Life is getting harder and harder. The situations that people are facing are, are greater than they have ever been before. And that gives them a greater hunger, a greater desire. We're going to start seeing people that are crying out and saying, God, I need you to send me someone. And we have to be united together and say, you know what, our church body, we're, we support each other. Because then that's going to say, you know what, people are going to see that. When you go outside, you're not going to be hard to approach because you're used to interacting with people. You love each other. You love people inside the church, and that's going to go outside the church. People are going to see that you have a love for people. You have a love to see people saved and won to the, to the kingdom of God. And for us to see that great revival, we need to be unified so when the storms of life come our way, we're there to help each other up. You know, we need unity so when new people come into the church, they're going to make a whole lot more mistakes than we make. They're going to struggle with a whole lot more things than we struggled with. But we can't say, you know what, hopefully you can make it. You have to say, you know what, brother, I see you going through this. I'm here to help you. Amen. Amen. And second, we need to be unified because if we can get to that place where nothing can come between us, not even the littlest of things, it doesn't have to be something that's a huge wedge that's drove between us. It can be something as simple as they didn't shake my hand. They didn't look at me when I looked at them. They didn't acknowledge me as I walked out the church. Those are petty things. Those are petty little things. Think about it this way. How many of us have things racing through our mind right now? You know, if you miss somebody, you don't see somebody out of the corner of your eye. You don't know what they're going through. You know, maybe they're wondering, do I have enough gas to get home? Do I have enough food in my fridge that I'm going to be able to eat tonight? We face life. We face situations. Unless you know what your brother's really going through, why are you going to hold them accountable for something so small? Because they can be going through something that's so much greater and saying, you know what, I need help from somebody. And if you let that little thing drive a wedge between you, you can be the person that helps them out a situation. But if you allow that thing to come between you, you can be the one that says, you know what, I'm just going to let them figure it out for themselves. And they're saying, you know what, I wish that brother would come up to me. I wish that brother would help me. I know they've gone through this before. I know they've made it through. I need them to help me through this. Amen, amen. God's speaking in this place tonight. God's going to bring a revival to our church. He's going to bring a revival. But are we going to be settled with just a revival and say, you know what, that's enough? Or are we going to be able to say, you know what, this was the greatest revival our church has ever seen? I know at one point our church ran probably close to 300, if not more than that. Would you say that? Somewhere about there. But I, I believe that God wants to take us past that point. God wants to bring a revival that we could never imagine. That's something that's been an ongoing thought and theme in my head. 
God's going to take us to places that we could never imagine, that we've never seen before. God's going to bring a revival that is going to turn our city, our world upside down. We're seeing it in other churches and we're encouraged of that growth. We get happy when we see our brothers and our sisters. But there's been many of preachers and pastors and evangelists that have got behind this same pulpit. I know it's a little bit different construction, different wood, but it's, it's the same spot. And they've got back here people with a lot better name than I have, a lot better pedigree or, or anything like that. But the message is still the same from God. There's going to be a great revival in our city. Amen. Amen. If we can all just stand, I'm coming to the end of my message here. And I want to encourage us today, this morning, if we can just step out, if we can just come to the front. And as we come to the front, I want us to find at least one person to pray with. If it's a couple of us getting together, that's, that's even better. But unity is going to start right now. We have to start right now. Because for us to see that revival, we have to say, you know what, God, I'm going to start today. I'm not going to wait till tomorrow because tomorrow won't come. Revival is going to come but we have to become unified as a church body. Can we all, let's just close our eyes. Let's find someone to pray with in this place. Let's start that process of become, becoming unified. Let's say, you know what, I'm going to help you grow spiritually. I'm not going to hold something against you, brother. I'm not going to hold something against you, sister. Amen, amen. Come on, let's just close our eyes. Let's invite the presence of the Lord into this place today.